Hello. This is another episode of This Week with David Rovix, which you can find for free on all the usual podcasting platforms, along with my other podcast, Song for Today. If you search for This Week with David Rovix or Song for Today on the podcasting platform of your choice, be it Spotify, Google, Apple, or another platform that gets most of their content from Apple, which is most platforms last I checked. You can also find both podcasts on my YouTube channel, on SoundCloud, via the Pacifica Radio audio port, on the Folk Music Notebook internet radio station at davidrovix.com, and on the free David Rovix mobile app, which you can find by searching for David Rovix in either the Google or Apple app stores. Okay, here we go. A Week in the Northeast a prison, a protest, an art exhibit, a family farm, an anti-war conference, rent control, World War I, and Hunter Biden. Are you going to write something about this? If you do, I'll share it. This wasn't exactly a writing assignment from one of the co-founders of the venerable anarchist newspaper from Detroit Fifth Estate, but close enough to prompt a travelogue that I'd likely have written anyway. Peter Werby and I were walking away from the Federal Correctional Institution in Danbury, Connecticut, after spending most of the afternoon visiting our mutual friend, Marius Mason, prisoner number 04672-061. I don't tour in my own country much anymore for financial reasons that my regular readers and listeners have already heard too much about, but occasionally a short regional tour works itself out, and this was the case last week in the northeastern U.S., Months ago, Peter had told me he was planning to visit Marius in prison in September, so I poked around to see if there might be a gig out there that would cover my airfare so I could join him on, in that endeavor. Sure enough, there was. My sister Bonnie decided to throw her formidable energies into helping organize a movement to end the ban on rent control in the state of Massachusetts, with last weekend being a sort of kickoff for the campaign. As my accidentally good timing would have it, there were also other events for me to participate in during the week I was around there in my old stomping grounds. Peter and I both flew into Boston and headed up in our rental car towards Waterville, Maine. The first sort of gig on the little tour would be the opening for an exhibit of Marius's artwork, art made in prison over the years, that he mailed to different people. Various people were involved with organizing the exhibit, including someone I hadn't seen in decades, since back when he lived in the Boston area. Now far from Boston, Peter and I spent one night up in or one night up in Maine, deep in the woods north of Waterville, in a very impressive homestead full of organic vegetables, a maple sugar shack, big solar panels, and all sorts of sculptures and such embedded in the landscape. If a political prisoner had gotten a letter postmarked in Maine in the past 25 years, there's a good chance it came from here. Posters with the faces of Malcolm Bell and other current and former political prisoners adorned various walls. <clears throat> it was coincidentally the day of lots of climate-related protests around the world, including outside the UN in Manhattan, with Greta Thunberg and in thousands of other towns and cities, including Waterville, Maine. Peter and I got into town early enough to explore it a bit and to participate in a small protest after spending the night at the homestead. As with so many other protest vigil types, uh, type things in the U.S., the focus was on a major intersection in town. People with signs faced the traffic. I understand why this is done, but I always find it disheartening that we have to be so oriented towards people in their cars in order for anyone to know we're there. It also means we're not paying attention to each other, but only to getting the attention of people who are in their cars. There were two people with acoustic guitars, but you couldn't hear them over the traffic noise much. Being a fair-weather sign holder myself, I didn't stay long. Another old friend of Marius's, former spokesperson of the Earth Liberation Front, who is part of a bookstore collective in Buffalo, New York these days, Leslie James Pickering, gave a talk, along with Peter, where the exhibit was happening in the lobby of an art cinema. And I sang. One of the movies being shown was Official Secrets, so whether people had come for the art opening or for a movie, it was a good crowd. The art we were looking at included pieces that the artist himself had not been able to see uh, in years. They were made and mailed off, 
never to be seen again. There are ways, but as with most things involving prisoners, there are at least extra steps involved. Forget about mailing packages or exchanging emails. Only a handful of people are allowed to email with Marius, and then it's on a special platform run by the prison that doesn't allow for things like pictures or music. Peter and I headed back to Boston after the opening, getting in late. The next day was filled with events around the rent control campaign, my favorite of which was the dinner event attended by many veteran organizers from around the Boston area, some of whom I first encountered myself when I lived in Boston in the 90s, like former city councilor Chuck Turner. Visiting hours at the prison are from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. on Saturdays and Sundays, more or less the same as the federal prison in Fort Worth, Texas where Peter and I had made several prior trips to visit Marius. The events in Boston were on Saturday, so early Sunday morning we left for Danbury, Connecticut. I was born in New York City and raised in Wilton, Connecticut, which is a bit south of Danbury on Route 7. In the summers my family rented a half of a dilapidated farmhouse north of Danbury in Cornwall Bridge, a sparsely populated part of northwestern Connecticut in the foothills of the Berkshires, a bit more than a stone's throw from the borders of both New York and Massachusetts. As a young man, my father moved to Danbury, and I have long had friends in the little city as well. So basically I'd driven past the federal prison there on the road between the center of Danbury and the town of New Fairfield, probably a thousand times or more. Last weekend was the first time I ever actually turned in down the road that leads to the prison, and the first time I ever went over that hill and got a good look at the barbed wire. I was glad to hear that Marius had been transferred from Texas to Connecticut. I live on the West Coast these days, but I still manage to get back to Connecticut more often than I have reason to go to Texas. Also, my assumption was that being imprisoned in Connecticut would be better than being imprisoned in Texas. After visiting Marius there, I'm not at all sure that's an accurate assumption. The climate is nicer for sure, and you can see mountains with trees on them, which is better than being on the outskirts of the sprawling city of Fort Worth, adjacent to a huge military base. There is no gate you have to go through to get into the prison complex, so it seems slightly less unwelcoming for visitors at first. Inside, though, it's the same. The same barbed wire, the same manicured little lawns outside the same impossibly thick automatic steel doors. Three plastic chairs and a plastic table were set out for us to sit around in the visiting room. In past visits in Texas, we visited Marius in a room that was only for certain very scary prisoners like him, where we were alone with Marius and a guard. Later, we'd visit him in a bigger room with other prisoners and their visitors, which was the situation in Danbury. But in Texas, we could go outside and hang out in one of the little manicured lawn areas. Here we couldn't. I also learned that Marius has even less access to guitars and writing materials and art materials in Danbury compared with Texas. The vending machines <clears throat> in the visiting room were full of the same dire nutritionless crap as the vending machines in Texas. For a vegan like Marius, there's nothing edible. We had almost three hours together, but it went so quickly, as always. It's much longer than the 15 minutes we're allowed to talk on our rare phone conversation, so you'd think three hours would seem luxurious, but it doesn't. There's far too much to say, much too much to catch up on, personal lives, logistics of various kinds, political analyses. There are no clocks on the walls and no watches, given that visitors aren't allowed to bring their phones with them and no one wears watches anymore. So when it was three o'clock, Peter and I were both caught unawares. Though once the guard announced the time, I realized that other people around us knew the time was coming. This, I realized, was why there were two different small children having meltdowns in the room. Their time with their mother would be ending, and they had to leave the prison with their father, who had taken them to visit their mother. Seeing the children processing their environment the whole time we were in there was constantly heartbreaking. The children's father was kind and loving, but if he hadn't been that sort, it's hard to imagine how much more heartbreaking it might have been to witness them walking away from their mother once again clearly not wanting to leave without her, clearly resigned to the profound injustice of their lives, knowing the procedure, what was coming next, and how no tantrum would be enough to cause anything to change at all. 
Driving from Danbury to New York City the next day, I wondered how another long-term ELF prisoner, Daniel McGowan, is doing. Last I saw him, he was under house arrest in Manhattan. Then he spent many years in prison, and now he's out again. We exchanged a letter once. Too many things slipped through the cracks. The event I was singing at in Manhattan was radically altered in terms of the speakers who'd be speaking, due to the fact that two of the people who were supposed to be the main speakers were not suddenly allowed to leave the United Nations. Traditionally, diplomats from the many countries that had bad relations with the U.S. could travel freely within a 25-mile radius of the U.N., but the Trump administration had just informed certain diplomats that they were now only allowed to travel from the airport to their residence and to the U.N., nowhere else. My last gig on the trip was back in Danbury, where the organizer, an academic named John Coleman, who is starting up a little school of some kind, wanted me to focus my set on the end of the First World War, a period I've written about fairly extensively. 1919, like 2019, was a period of great uncertainty about the future, and conflict within this and many other societies. It was a crossroads, a period where the future was being determined largely by those advocating some form of socialism or those advocating some form of fascism. Flying home, catching up on rapidly evolving news developments with the Democrats announcing their latest impeachment plans, it is once again abundantly obvious why people like me and John keep on coming back to these historical parallels between the present time and the interwar period that began a little over a century ago. As I have pointed out on various occasions in song and prose, the rise of fascism in Germany was born out of the failure of democracy, basically. The democratically elected government, led by social democrats who supposedly were interested in the welfare of the working class, failed to harness the immense wealth of the country, ravaged, of course, in so many ways by World War I as it was, in such a way that would have allowed the German people to eat. As fascism became more and more popular, and communists tried to form alliances with the social democrats, imperfect as they were. It was too late. And now I learn about the extent of the corruption of the Biden family dynasty, which is perhaps going to be attempting to represent some kind of more progressive alternative to Trumpism in the 2020 U.S. elections. This man whose son made $50,000 a month lobbying for a Ukrainian gas company after his father helped orchestrate a coup against the former government there is to be the guy who is ostensibly going to bring together the working class and all kinds of other folks to defeat Trump, who is also the current patriarch of a family of corrupt lobbyists and business people. To be clear, barring Trump's imminent impeachment, assuming the 2020 election goes forward, we are being given the choice between one politician who is accused of being compromised by Russian money and another who appears to be compromised by Ukrainian money. And both of them are in bed with the arms industry. Welcome to the auction. On the bright side, it would seem entirely possible that Marius will be joined in the federal prison there sometime soon by someone either with the last name of Trump or the last name of Biden. Maybe both. When Joe Biden was vice president in 2014 Perhaps it was not a coincidence as it was quickly seen Ukraine was overthrown more or less This new government was very closely aligned with the U.S. And the VP was sent over there many, many times Just to put it in a little context, that was the climb He was working very closely with the Ukrainian state Which is all very related to this congressional debate When Joe Biden was veep hanging out in Ukraine Perhaps there is someone who could help to explain Why when his son Hunter was kicked out of the knee how he wasn't riding a train made of gravy when suddenly the young man had a corporate job i guess that could have happened to any other georgetown slob consulting with kiev making millions of dollars but it looks a lot like a leash and collar looks like c-o-r r-u-p-t-i-o-n this is the ballad of Delaware Joe and Kiev's Hunter Biden. Now it's only circumstantial evidence 
But it's increasingly hard to sit on this fence It could be that there isn't any smoking gun But when the U.S. Vice President's son Makes twice as much money as his father was paid It sure sounds like Hunter would have made the grade To lobby for a foreign power If his last name was Trump He could have worked in Trump Tower Looks like C-O-R-R-U-P-T-I-O-N This is the ballot of Delaware Joe And Kiev's Hunter Biden where the pieces fall now is anybody's guess. The Senate will have their hearings here in the U.S. War, peace, impeachment, who knows what comes next. But if the pattern holds, we all know what to expect. A state controlled by money, whether domestic or overseas. A nation ruled by nepotism, by family dynasties. Politicians acting just as you'd expect puppets to do. Sold to the highest bidder, whether purple, red, or blue. C-O-R-R-U-P-T-I-O-N This is the ballad of Delaware Joe and Kiev's Hunter Biden. C-O-R-R-U-P-T-I-O-N This is the ballad of Delaware Joe and Kiev's Hunter Biden. This has been episode 54 of This Week with David Rovix. If you're able to support the work I'm doing, it is all entirely crowdfunded. Go to davidrovix.com slash subscribe to learn how you can join my community-supported art program. Hope to see you again here in cyberspace, as well as on the road over the next few weeks, if you happen to live in Illinois, Germany, Ireland, Scotland, or England. More on all that at davidrovix.com.